There are a couple types of people who don't accept evolution for various reasons. The first type being those who don't accept it purely for religious reasons. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that you could ever show them to get them to accept evolution, so this video is not really directed at them. This is directed at the second group of people who are simply unsure of evolution, the evidence for it, or have just been misled. Now there are a couple different myths that creationists use to perpetuate their cause, and that's exactly what this video is going to dispel. These are some of the main hindering blocks that people have in accepting evolution. The first common myth is that evolution is just a theory, or that you have to believe in evolution. And this is not true because it's a fallacy of equivocation. You're falsely equating the term theory that we use in everyday language to describe, you know, just a hypothesis or something people aren't sure of, with a scientific theory. Now, the National Academy of Sciences a couple years ago listed evolution in one of the top five most influential sciences that has led to some of the biggest advances that we've seen in biology. Furthermore, you don't believe in evolution, you accept it. Evolution is falsifiable, makes predictions, and has evidence to support it, so it requires no faith whatsoever. For further evidence, let's take a look at some other theories. The cell theory, the atomic theory. There's no such thing as the law of cells or the law of atoms. These are both scientific theories which hold a high degree of certainty and proof, just like evolution does. Another common misconception people have is the confusion of evolution and abiogenesis. That is, the idea that living matter can arise from non-living matter. Evolution says absolutely nothing about how the universe came into existence, what formed the stars, what formed the earth, or even how life got here on earth. Evolution only deals with life once it's already here. So the example that, or the thought that God created life on earth and it evolved from there isn't necessarily inconsistent with evolution. It's not necessarily supported by it, but it's not ruled out, since again, evolution only deals with life once it's already here. Now, a second thing is spontaneous generation, which, again, is the idea that living matter can arise from non-living matter, and Pasteur disproved this back a couple centuries ago. However, this says nothing about abiogenesis or evolution whatsoever, because what Pasteur showed is that when flies are denied access to rotting meat, maggots don't form. So, the fact that flies didn't form on rotting meat after a weekend hardly does anything to discredit uh, an idea which takes billions of years to occur. Now a second and very dishonest technique that creationists use and misconception to further their cause is that many of the social ills that we see today in society are caused by evolution. They'll take a look at, for example, Answers in Genesis capitalizing off of the recent school shootings in Finland, Columbine, things like that, and any chance that they can get, they'll blame it on evolution. They'll blame the Holocaust on evolution. Just about anything that they can get their hands on, any kind of societal woes, they'll blame on evolution. First of all, this is completely irrelevant because, let's say, for example, that gravity caused people to kill themselves. Would that make gravity false whatsoever? I mean, people's reaction to a theory or an idea doesn't do anything for discrediting it as fact or its merit. Secondly, if you take a look at trends around the world and in the U.S. in general, one could probably make a much stronger case that evolution has caused a decrease in violent crime, decrease in rape, decrease in abortion, decrease in the vast majority of social ills. I'm not attributing this, I'm not attributing these declines to evolution, I'm just saying if you really wanted to take a look at the data, that's what it would suggest. Overall, worldwide trends of percentage of people who believe in evolution dictate that the higher percentage of a country's population believes in evolution, the less violent crime, less murder, less abortion, things like that it has. The same trend can be seen in the United States, too. Also, there's a temporal trend in the sense of the most violent periods in the U.S.'s history were before evolution was even taught. Again, I'm not suggesting that these declines are due to evolution. I'm simply saying that if you want to argue it, I've got a bunch better leg to stand on than you do. So another common stumbling block that people face on the road to accepting evolution is the idea that there's no way that we're here by chance. I mean, look around you, the leaves changing color, the seasons, the distance of the earth from the sun, the way everything biologically perfectly interacts just about. How could that all be here by chance? Personally, I agree with that. Luckily, evolution isn't chance whatsoever. It is mainly ruled by a natural selection, which is by definition a non-random process, and small mutations, which do provide the raw genetic material for which natural selection can act on. You can kind of liken it to 
natural or mutations rather being the turning of the ignition in a car and natural selection being the remaining eight hour car drive. Um, so again, something else that's interesting is that natural selection, again, bear in mind, non-random process, there have actually been computer models that have shown exactly how random mutations and natural selection can create new features and produce a highly fine-tuned result over time purely by random mutations and natural selection, thus again completely supporting evolution. Another comment and misconception that you often hear is that there are no transitional forms and that the fossil record somehow discredits evolution. Well, Dr. Ken Miller from Brown University once recalled a time where he was speaking with a colleague and talking about, you know, the lack of transitional forms, saying, well, you know, how do, how do you respond to these creationists who say there are no transitional forms whatsoever? And she basically went on to tell him that she was just at a conference, ironically, about a week ago where paleontologists re just broke out into a fistfight almost over whether or not you should call these new um, fossils that they were introducing mammal-like reptiles or reptilian mammals. So, I mean, if they're arguing over that, there's, there's clearly no lack of transitional forms whatsoever. If anything, we've got hundreds of them. We've got them going from fish to tetrapods, amphibians to reptiles, reptiles to birds, reptiles to mammals, and especially from primates going to man. Heck, take a look at Neanderthals. These guys were very, very sophisticated. They buried their dead and cared for their handicapped. Yet DNA shows that they weren't human. How can you account for that? Again, take a look at Archaeopteryx, too, which was, there were 11 specimens, I believe, found. Um, it's a perfect transition between reptiles and birds. Yes, it has a bunch of avian characteristics, which is what the creationists will tell you. However, morphologically, it probably has more reptilian characteristics. It is a perfect hybrid. By the way, discredit any um, quotes you hear from Dr. Alan Fiducia about it being fully avian, as that's not his intention in their fully quote mind, which I'll discuss later on. So again, we've got loads of transitional fossils, plain and simply. The fossil record more than backs up evolution. We've got just about anything that we want. Now another common misconception that creationists love to spread, because they count on their audience not knowing a whole lot about biology, is that mutations cannot add only information. They can only detract. This is utterly false. It's basic biology. You can find it in any freshman biology book. Gene duplication and a mutation in the duplicated segment will produce new information that natural selection can then work on. Um, as if this is an evidence, also take a look at nylonase, which is an irreducibly complex system which evolved through gene duplication and subsequent mutation natural selection in the past 70 years alone to enable bacteria to degrade nylon. This happened, by the way, in nature without man's help. So yes, there are plenty of mutations that can add information. Another common misconception that creation has spread about mutations is the fact, or the pseudo-fact, that all creations are bad. Some mutations are bad, that's definitely a fact. They are a cause of a lot of diseases. However, the vast majority of mutations don't affect the organism whatsoever, and a very, very small percentage of mutations are indeed good. For example, let's look at antibiotic resistance. Greatly increases the organism's ability to survive, and it's solely due to mutation. Also, the deletion of the CCR5 locus in the human genome. That in the individuals afflicted with that, it grants some immunity to both bubonic plague and HIV. I mean, those are clearly examples of mutations um, providing individuals with the selective advantage. Also, in terms of increasing inter um, information in general, look at the homeotic regional mutations that we can see in Drosophila and things like that. You can get entirely new wings, legs, appendages, and things like that forming from simple mutations. Again, debating with creationists really isn't that difficult to do because their entire argument is based on misunderstanding and ignorance. Um, that's it for the first half of the video. Make sure that you check out the second half of the video, which is coming right up.